Welcome to the Nerdist Podcast number 839, and happy Thanksgiving, if you're listening to this uh, the day that it goes out, which is uh, right before Thanksgiving. If not, forget this, or if you don't live in America and you don't celebrate Thanksgiving, then uh, let's just pretend this didn't happen, all right? But you could have turkey anyway. You know what? Go stuff a turkey. You don't need a holiday. You own that turkey. You can stuff whatever you want in it. Yeah, person who's not in America. Uh, this episode brought to you by Squarespace. Uh, maybe it's time to make whatever it is that you want to make online to create your online presence, either a landing page or a beautiful gallery or a blog or an online store, whatever it is. It's all included with your Squarespace website. So start your free trial today. Go to squarespace.com, enter the offer code NERDIST, get 10% off your first purchase. Do it! Make it happen for you! Make a thing and then tell people about your thing by building a thing. Is that clear enough? Uh, thanks to Squarespace. More about that in a second. But uh, let's now talk about the Nerdist Community Corkboard, the virtual corkboard by you, for you, the Nerdist Community about the goings-on in or near you. In or near you? All right. <laughs> you know what? I'm not even going to edit that out. Fine. If there's goings-on in you, God damn it! you let us know about it. Uh, most of these are in the external world, though. Uh, this when we create the virtual uh, microbe corkboard, then maybe we could explore that more as a theme. But right now, since it's Thanksgiving, why not give people who may not have as much as you something? Uh, comedian Sarah Schaefer, who is hilarious, you should see her live if you get a chance. Her sister runs a homeless shelter in Flagstaff, Arizona. And if you want to donate money or clothes or volunteer or whatever, go to flagshelter.org and check that out. And again, go see Sarah live if you get a chance. Also... Maybe it's time to adopt a pet, right? Maybe you need a new furry little buddy in your life that needs a home and you need a friend, so it's a perfect symbiotic relationship. You can feed off each other's joy. Uh, Zappos is actually sponsoring this Friday, November 25th or Monday, November 28th, uh, Home for the Holidays. It's an event, and uh, they're going to sponsor adoption fees for animal shelters all across the country. To get more info, find a shelter near you, visit zappos.com slash pets. Go adopt a pet. All right, good. This episode is Mr. Jeremy Irons, uh, who is, I mean, he may have one of the best voices in the history of voices. And uh, also, great, great person to sit down and chat with. If you ever get the opportunity to talk to Jeremy Irons, I suggest you do it. Uh, he is uh, delightful and also, P.S., he may have invited us to his castle in Ireland. I'm not trying to brag, maybe a little bit trying to brag, but why wouldn't I want to try to brag? Because someday I'm going to go to Jeremy Irons' castle in Ireland. And if you and I are friends, I'll take you. He said I could bring a few people. So uh, maybe not hundreds of thousands of people, but maybe just a couple. So I don't know. I mean, we'll see, we'll see how it goes. But I don't want to talk about it too much because I don't want to I don't want to jinx this budding friendship. I've already said too much. Damn it. You know what? Today that I'm recording this is actually my birthday. So you have to forgive me. And so does Jeremy Irons. And I'm still going to go to that castle. So uh, thanks to Jeremy Irons for coming and, and chatting with us for an hour. He is promoting The Man Who Knew Infinity, which is available now. You can rent it. You can buy it. Uh, it also stars Dev Patel. Uh, it has amazing reviews. It's a beautiful story of a brilliant mathematician named Ramanujan who, uh, well, it's, it's basically he's, he's fighting a class system in, uh, in the early 1900s in England to become this brilliant mathematician. I mean, he is a mathematician, and he sort of has to, the, the, the upper crust of, of British academics, he kind of has to fight his way in there, and Jeremy Irons uh, helps him do that in this movie. Uh, so absolutely, uh, it's, a bra- it's a brainy movie. It's a, it's a de- beautiful movie, so see it if you get a chance. I mean, honestly, anything Jeremy Irons is, anything, anything he plays is amazing. So... Uh, Check that out when you can. You have a whole weekend, hopefully, of uh, sitting around and a good good movie to watch with the family. Huh? Shut them up for two hours. Am I right? Huh? Who's with me? No. Me? Just me? I'm alone again? All right. I'll talk louder. Um, But uh, this episode also brought to you by Squarespace.com. Again, as I said, 
Uh, build a thing that is your online identity. Social media is not necessarily reliable to just house all of your identity. It'd be great to have a page or a grouping, a grouping of pages that you can express yourself more articulately than what you can on just a you know bite size fast food <laughs> fast food interaction social media so do that with squarespace it's really easy uh, it's a simple intuitive process any level of if you have coding experience or no coding experience it doesn't matter uh, you can get a free custom domain they're going to make adding a domain to your site simple if you sign up for a year you will get a custom domain for free for a year and then beautiful templates so your commerce tools if you want to sell stuff on there it's super easy 24 7 customer support Every member of the customer care team is an experienced Squarespace user uh, working in a Squarespace office. No matter how technical your problem is, they're going to help you, or trivial, they're going to help you sort it out. So start your free trial today, squarespace.com. Enter the offer code NERDIST. Get 10% off your first purchase. Uh, Squarespace, set your website apart. Thanks for sponsoring this episode of the Nerds Podcast. Number 839 with Mr. Jeremy Irons, my new best friend. Now, granted, we haven't spoken since we did the podcast, but I'm, you know... He's busy, right? He's he, but we're gonna we're gonna hang out. It's gonna happen. Katie, happy Thanksgiving. Now entering nerdist.com. How are you in general? I'm very well. That's great. Yeah, I'm very well. I'm looking forward to getting back to England. When does that happen? Uh, it happens on... Friday. Uh, Saturday I get back, don't I? Yeah. Because I've been, I've been shooting a movie in, uh, in Louisville for the last five weeks, I think. And, um, and I, have to, uh, I have to go off to shoot another movie in Atlanta, and I have a week, just a week at home, and that'll be nice. You know how it is getting home. Having been born in Louisville, Kentucky, I can tell you that it is nothing like England. Are you kidding? You were born there? <laughs> I was born there, yeah. How cool right. Is yeah, yeah, yeah. I was born there and Well it's fine. Tennessee. Louisville's fine. It's but, all right. Yeah. It's not I mean, listen, if I were given the choice, sorry yeah. Louisville, but I'm gonna go to England yeah. if I were given the choice. Yeah. What part of England are you in now? I live um uh, I live in Oxfordshire, which is between London and Oxford and I also live in Ireland some of the time. Oh, you have a castle. Yeah. I have a, mm. You have like a 15th century castle. That's right. I read about it. Yeah. How does one acquire a castle? Is there a, is there some, is there a specific process? No, it's like buying anywhere, really. I mean, Ireland is full of ruins. Right. And I bought mine as a ruin. It had been ruined since 1603. Oh, my God. Um, and, but it hadn't been – it had been well built. And so uh, there was some destruction, but, but it was – basically sound so we just went from there and put it back together and now we live in it and, and it's very it's a tower or two towers actually two joined towers about a hundred foot high on a little island overlooking the bay and the islands and America are there rules uh is in America, if you buy something that's historical, there are some rules for how you can... I, I was very lucky. I had two rules. One was that I shouldn't make any more openings, uh, any more window openings, um, and that I should use oak for the, uh, for the timber that I put in. Those are the only two rules. So did you... I assume you updated it. You put in heating I and did, everything. Yeah. Heating and plumbing and, and electricity and... Uh, uh, yeah, and I sealed it because they they used not to be sealed. You'd have just wooden shutters, right? Uh, you wouldn't have glass or anything. So the the building was designed to breathe. And when you put heating in and 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 um, close windows, uh, then you stop that happening. So you have to make very sure that you are allowing it to breathe while at the same time allowing it to be warm and and uh, sort of like we like places now to live in sure you know, we're, we're quite spoiled these days <laughs> if you didn't if you didn't ever if you decided hey i don't ever want to do anything else i just want to go somewhere and be there forever would it be the castle is that i think it would 
I think it would. I mean, it's a very invigorating place to be, although it has a lot of stairs. So as I get older, I'd have to think carefully about that. But uh, it, 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 it's in the eye of the weather. And you're always conscious about wind direction and, and what the weather is. It's just part of your life there. Sure. Um, you get stunning skies always. Everything is always changing because the wind uh, speed is changing and the wind direction. So the water that surrounds you is always changing. Uh, it, it's it's. Uh, I have my boat there, so I can, you know, in the evening if it's a nice evening, I get in and sail off for a couple of hours, and that's nice. And I have my horses nearby so I can go riding. And, and there's always great music, either in the castle or in, in some of the pubs around. Um, so it's, it's all the things I love doing, I can do there. And do you reward yourself? <laughs> do you take, you work kind of back to back and then you say, well, but I know at this time of year I'm going to go to the castle and that. Could you sort of defer your, your enjoyment? I, I try to. I try to. I, I, I try to say I'm going to have Christmas there, certainly, and the summer, um, or the spring and the autumn, if I can't get the midsummer, which are great seasons. But, you know, work sometimes does really come and get in the way. Um, I wasn't there this summer. I was there for about three weeks, I think, two weeks. And, and, and you miss that. But, yeah, you take what you can, you know. <laughs> Does it ever, the feeling of, just the concept of work, I mean, I assume you do it, obviously, because you still love doing it, but do you still feel that thing from when you were a kid where you're like, I need to work, I gotta work, an actor needs to work? No. So no. you just do it because you love it? I've never had that. I've never really had that. I mean, I, I, I'm, I remember one job I had to go off and do, and I thought, damn it, I'm in the middle of doing this. I can't remember what I was doing, converting a house or doing up something. And I thought, I'm in the middle of this. Wow, i got to go off to work. And I thought, whoops, wait a minute. You're supposed to be an actor. You know, that's what you're supposed to be doing. Go off and do that. But I have to say, I work to live. I don't live to work. Um, and as I get older, I don't have to work so much. You know, I've educated my kids, and, and so I don't have to earn quite the same amount. And I know that life, as you get older, is getting shorter. I don't know how much shorter it's getting, but it's certainly getting shorter. Uh, and it's my own, the only life I'm ever going to have. So I might as well make sure that I'm um, using, using that time wisely. And I, I think we all work too much, or those of us who have work. Sure. I mean... I, I, I think you only need to have about a day, a day's work a week. If you have that, it gives you pride. You know what you're doing. It gives you focus. Um, but we could all fill those other six days very easily. But if you don't have work, then all you're doing is just you're feeling useless. You're hanging about. You know, I'm thinking of, of so many of the unemployed in this country and in England. Um, and I think we need to try to structure a society so that everybody has something of which they can be proud of doing. Sure. Um, and, and that's not hard to organize. But we don't seem to be caring about those people at the moment. And, and I think there are possibly, I see especially in this city in Los Angeles, you know, people working, taking sort of 5 a.m. meetings uh, and getting home at nine, and hopefully they'll see the kids before they go to bed, and and that's their life. Um, I think that's a pretty poor way to live, personally. Well, I think it, it. I think a lot of it probably comes from early on. You know, you think, well, I have to, I have to make a mark. I have to do this. I want to do this as much as possible. And then before you know it, you're just absorbed. And you have all these responsibilities, and you feel like, well, if I take any of these away, this mm. is going to topple. Mm. You know, and the truth is, a, a lot of it won't. No. I mean, you can take things away and realize, oh, actually, it's okay. But we do condition ourselves. And we also reward, you know, as someone who works a ton, we do think that that is the correct way to oh no you have to work yourself until you and i'm starting to realize no you should really spend time enjoying the world that's right and being with people that you care about it's very recent i mean it's only really since the industrial revolution that that people have thought um the just their, their justification is how much work they do 
before that, you know, you would, I mean, in Ireland, for instance, you'd plant your potatoes and then you'd wait. <laughs> Do I mean, I can't, sometimes I imagine, could I exist in another time period? Yeah. And I honestly think, I think there's, I think the noises in my head are just too much. I need the distraction of constant work. I don't know how I would year in, year out, you know, for most of the year, just sit and stare Mm. at the water. Mm. I don't know if I could do it. Are you good with that? I'm great at that. (laughs) I love doing that. Um, I think we have so many distractions. I mean, it's very interesting. I I went walking, I don't know, 10 years ago in, in Nepal for two weeks. And uh, and we walked up in the in the kingdom of Mustang, which is a part of northern Nepal, which goes into what used to be Tibet. I mean, it, it, it used Mustang used to be Tibet. It's right on the Chinese border. And we walked as a family. We had some Sherpas with us, um, but we walked as a family for two weeks. We passed one other Western group in the second week as we were walking back down the valley. They were going up. They were French. And the only other people we saw were villagers and priests. And what you're looking at is mountains, sort of slow mountain ranges, which you're walking up and then over into the next valley and down to the green and then up again along these old tracks. And the rock, yeah, the colour of the rock changes and and it's sometimes mesmerising, sometimes there's something a bit unusual, a little temple or something. But in the main, you are walking without distraction. You're walking without all the impetuses, which, I mean, driving here today, you know, I mean, Los Angeles is is, is the classic example. (laughs) Everywhere you look, there's something asking you to vote a certain way or buy a certain thing or, you know, all the time these are coming at you. When you take that away, as we did when we walked on that journey, your imagination just takes fire and you start thinking, you start thinking of stories, you start thinking of... Because it's not being bombarded. And I think the life we live in, our imagination sort of has to close down a little bit just to deal with all the impulses that sure. are coming at us. And I remember talking to somebody who spent a lot of time in Antarctica and she wrote a book about it, actually. And, and, and she said exactly that. Because you're just surrounded by white... And there may be, you know, perhaps a bit of a mountain range to your left, which is white, or maybe the sea to your right, which is blue. Or, but, but basically, you're surrounded by white. There's nothing else. And your ma- imagination takes wing. Um, and, and Nepal was a bit like that. So, so I'm very happy sitting, staring out to the sea and, and, and living a, a calmer life than one does in a metropolis. It's interesting to hear that about you because I think one of the things that defines how I think of you as a performer is like, oh, he's effortless. Like, it's very seamless. Your performances are just so, uh, they, they just feel so natural in a way. But hearing that that's kind of how you are as a person makes a lot of, makes mm-hmm. a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. Was that just a way that you, because of your family, or did you, I mean, that's relatively uncommon. Particularly, I feel like in this business where people are so f- full of insecurities or full of themselves or full of whatever or all the distractions, like you said. So how, how, how did that happen? I don't know. I've always – I mean, I became an actor because I had a, a, a desire to be in some way sort of gypsy. To, to, uh, I was brought up in a, in, in a private school. My education was private. I was surrounded by sort of people who wanted to be high achievers or not actually terribly high achievers, sort of middle-range achievers and go into the military or go into banking or business or whatever. And I thought they were all quite boring. Um, and I thought when, it, when the time came, when I got to 17 and people started asking me what I wanted to do, I thought, well, I want to do something which doesn't involve any of these people. <laughs> um, and, and I thought that, I thought about the fun fair, or what you call the carnival, I think, right. the circus, mm-hmm. and the theatre. Because I thought, those are people who, who run something that moves round, and they're a community, but they just move round from place to place outside society. 
uh, and I think that would suit me. So I went and I looked at um, at fun fairs, and I looked at the accommodation, and I looked at circuses, and went round the back and talked to the people and looked at the accommodation. I thought, I think I'm a little bit middle class for this. I think I need a bit more room than a stall with sort of four bunks in. And, mm-hmm. uh, I'll try the theatre. So I answered an advertisement on the back of a newspaper and went and worked as a what they called an acting ASM, which meant that you you set the stage, you made props, and you also appeared in little non-speaking roles. And I lived that life in Canterbury for about four months, and I loved it. I loved the people. I loved the smells. I loved the routine of it. Um... So I thought, well, I better learn how to do this. So then I started auditioning for theatre school. Uh, but it was to get to have that life. I, I was not interested in riches because I didn't think that they would come. Uh, I wasn't interested in fame because I didn't think I'd have that. I just wanted to be in this group of storytellers, um, and each night telling our story, then going out late and getting up late in the morning, sort of out of sync with normal life. And that was very attractive to me, and and that's what I that's why I became an actor, and never showed. I mean, I never had a burning desire to act. I think I would have been equally happy to have been a technician, you know, to have been a a lighting designer or a cameraman or sound man. Um, although, after about four years, uh, when I started out, I, I remember one particular night I was doing a musical in London. And I was sitting on the stage because someone else was doing a song. Um, and uh, I, I thought, I remember thinking, I remember the moment, thinking, you know, this is a business that I slipped on quite unthinkingly, like a pair of gloves. But actually, they fit me perfectly. And this really fits me. This routine, this way of working fits my makeup perfectly. And I think what I've tried to do in life and with the characters I play is to be loose enough and open enough and calm enough to listen to myself and what I need and also to hear the characters. Um, and I think I do it with everything. I mean, when I did Up the Castle, which you mentioned earlier, you know, I, I looked at it, I spent time in it, I went and looked at others, other ruins, and and read everything I could about them and then started hiring people. I didn't have an architect. I had a draftswoman who would draw up plans. Um, and I would hire people. And I normally hired people who were good musicians because I found, A, it was nice in the evening, we could all play together, but B, somehow they were better workers. They were better for this project than those who didn't play music. Um, so those are all very little sort of gentle decisions but decisions which come out of just listening to what's happening to you and about and to a building or to a you know when I read a script what comes out to me from that script does it does it interest me is it does it tickle my phagocytes, as, as they say? <laughs> <laughs> I know you don't have... I, I, I assume you're probably not on social media, but if you were, tickling my phagocytes would be the best profile bio on any social media. I mean, it's... You know, when you, when you can get all the distraction out of the way, though, I think that's, that's a lot of life's challenges is not actually even the external world. It's how do you get out of the internal world... Mm to see that or Mm. to be able to make those decisions because, you know, if you're coming from a place of ego or fear or it's, you just, it's difficult to make good decisions. Mm. So you never, you legitimately didn't ever really struggle with that. You just sort of had a natural sense of, no, I'm going to do what I want. I think so. I mean, of course, starting off, um, uh, I had to get used to various things about the business, I had to get you. Well, when I became successful in my sort of early thirties, and I began to get fame, I had to get used to the fact that uh, I, I had lost um, my privacy to a certain extent. I mean, more in some places than others. But privacy is a funny thing because, you know, if you go into a restaurant with a hundred people eating, 
and only one person knows you, that's fine, you, uh, but you don't know which person. <laughs> so for you, they all do. Sure. And that took me a long time to settle. It took me about a year to settle into until finally I discovered that all it means really is that the world is your village. And I was brought up in a village in the Isle of Wight, St. Helens. Right. Um, so as, if I walked my dog on the street, people would know me and I'd say hello and... And that was sort of fine. If we had a huge row at home, word may, may get about because <laughs> people would hear. So that's the downside of living in a village. Um, people want to see your dirty laundry. But if you cope with that and try and keep your dirty laundry as private as possible, then all it means is the world's your village. And there's something very nice about that. Because if people know you or think they know you, then they hopefully like you sure, and trust you. Um, and so it just makes life easier. And it means that you can... What it allows me to do is to speak to people, to get inside the bullshit immediately and just speak to people because they feel comfortable because they sort of know me. Sure. And, and once they see that I don't um, uh, hold any, uh, any uh, sort of high opinion of myself... Um, which they always expect you to do because you are, so to speak, successful. <laughs> right, right. But once you get rid of that bullshit, then you can just cut in and really communicate. And, of course, that's what you have to do when you're acting. Um, but it's also great in life. But they know... Uh, I mean, they do, like you said, they sort of know you, but they know this kind of two-dimensional representation of who they think you are pieced together with, you know... A, a dash of this character and a little bit of that guy, and mm. so they don't. Mm. And so, do you prefer it that way, or do you enjoy connecting with people and saying, "Hey, you know, actually, I'm this is a little bit of who I am for real." I do enjoy connecting. I think, I mean, I don't think I wear my heart on my sleeve. Um, in other words, I think you have to earn real friendship and real getting to know somebody. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and that takes time. I'm not one of those people, I hope, who appears to give everything to a stranger. Mm -hmm. um, it's a balance. I mean, there's no doubt that I'm I'm different here talking to you than I would be if I was sitting in the kitchen with my wife talking to her. Sure. Um, so we have various levels of it. But I hope that I can talk to you without pretense. Yeah. Do you know? So we actually touch. And and that's the same in the work, really. I mean, it's very interesting. The Man Who Knew Infinity, which is a movie that I've been working on. And, I saw it last night. Right. It's great. Well, well it's, that relationship between the two men is, is fascinating. It's quite gentle. And yet it's quite strong because there's a, a real sort of emotional growth between them. Mm -hmm. Um and I think as an actor, it's very helpful if you can be open to allow that to appear because that's a very difficult thing to act. It's something you have to feel and have to be. Particularly at that time. I mean, the, for people who haven't, if they haven't seen it um, yet, it, of course, yet of course they, or, they will. They will. <laughs> a man who knew infinity. The man who knew infinity. Uh, Ramanujan is this, this young Indian, a natural mathematician. Yeah. And he, I mean, it's really, when I was watching, I was like, I feel like the story of Goodwill Hunting was somewhat, must have been based on this guy. Because he is, you know. In fact, he's mentioned, he's mentioned in Goodwill Hunting. Oh, he is. I think Robin Williams talks about Ramanujan. But it's, he is, he's from a small village in India, and there's, no reason that anyone should take him seriously as a mathematician, but he's essentially, you know, like Mozart, just drawing these these formulas from the heavens, and he feels that there's a divinity in it. And your character Hardy is is you know I can't I don't believe anything I can't prove. And he comes to uh, he comes to Trinity College, and essentially Hardy tries to help win over the stodgy. But what I found was interesting: the two major themes of the movie seem to be. You know, uh, faith versus science, what you can prove, what you can touch, and also the notion of change. Mm. And particularly at that time when, you know, there were, there were political sensitivities between 
between England and India, uh, and then this young Indian kid. Comes. Well, it wasn't political sensitivities. I mean, India was one of our colonies. Yes, and and person, people with dark skin were not nearly as clever or valuable as people with white skin in England, and so I mean that was the state of it then. Uh, it's 1913. Um, so to come into a bastion uh, like Cambridge University, you know, full of academics who are cut off anyway from whatever real life there is around them, um, for this Indian to, to, to be brought over was an assault on all their, uh, for a lot of them, uh, on, on all their prejudices. And the fact that he was a great deal cleverer than any of them is very difficult to take. So there's all that happening as well. His Hardy's statement, and he even seems kind of resistant to change in the beginning. He seems a little resistant to change, but of all the characters, he's the one that is most willing to, with the exception of Bertrand Russell, mm. to accept this change. Um, and he says, you know, he kind of says, change is good, change is good. Do you believe that? I believe change is good. I mean, we've just had a big change in England with the Brexit. Of vote. course. Um, and, uh, I I hope that we're reevaluating um the capitalist society we live in um which is being seen to be um a bit of a, a a bit of a problem at the moment I think I think I think un unrelieved and unregulated capitalism like any unregulated behavior uh, is a danger to society. And I think the Brexit vote was a little sign of that, and I think Trump's following in your country is, is a sign of that, that, that people are saying, wait a minute, global capitalism is wonderful, it makes everybody very rich, and, and, and governments court, court it because they need it for their funds and they need it for their taxes. But it seems to be ignoring the guy in the street not just the unemployed but the middle classes and i think we have to come up short a little bit and think wait a minute our economy should be serving our population and at the moment it's not um people are being squeezed people are hurting some people are earning enormous amounts. Some companies are earning enormous amounts. And that doesn't seem to be trickling down. Uh, and I think we have to redesign capitalism so that it spreads through. Um, capitalism is like water. It, we need it to survive as countries. But like water, if it's unregulated, it will drown us. Mm -hmm. And I think it nearly drowned us in 2008. And we bailed out the banks and we kept the system going because they were always very frightened what would happen if the system really collapsed. And it would have been frightening. Um, but what we didn't take care of were people with mortgages who'd bought far higher than they could afford now the prices have collapsed, and so their homes, the most important thing for in any society, are people's homes, the roof over their head. I mean, homes and, and to be able to earn enough to feed the family. Sure. That's all people need. Um, that was ignored uh, in, the, in the repair subsequent to, to 2008, both here and, and in Europe and, and, and in England. And I think that has to be addressed um, and, and, and the Brexit vote, I think, was just a, a vote about that. It was saying, hang on, guys, it may be very good for you in Brussels and, uh, you know, no trade barriers and all of that. And the, the financiers are getting very rich in London and they're providing tax, which pays for our roads and all of that, yes, sure. But what we're not getting is work for the man in the street. And the man in the street, I think I need, I need work. I need, I only need it maybe one day a week. And it could be voluntary work. But I, I need money to, 
to buy food for my family. But I need work for my self-respect. Sure. And I think that's how, what, what governments should be working towards trying to do, to make sure that every man has the work that gives him self-respect and the income which allows him to feed his family. And for those people who haven't got it, when they read these enormous figures um, that, that some people get as bonuses and that company profits, etc., it just doesn't make sense. And that leads to a great unhappiness. And I think that's what encourages people to vote for a person like Trump or indeed Farage and and get us out. Well, I mean, Europe. you know, you, you you see like a massive corporation fails, the CEO gets ousted, but he gets like a, you know, $100 million yeah. severance package. Like, wait, how do you, yeah. what other job can, yeah, are you rewarded for failing at? I mean, yeah. it's such a strange, but did you, because you feel this way, was there a period or do you, did it ever feel weird to you that as a performer, you know, you, you'll get paid an inordinate amount of money for a few months of work? I mean, does, was that, did you feel guilt about that, or does that feel strange, or how do you how do you wrap your head around that? Well, the thing is, like the guy who who gets the huge payoff when he's sacked from Wells Fargo or whatever, you sort of take it for granted. You forget this cushion that you're living on. I mean, I am one of the top one, one, one of the one percent. Maybe you're one of the one percent. Actually, um, you don't have to earn that much to be one of the one percent to the highest earners in the world, because there are so many poor people. Um, yeah, it is a uh, it, it is something I should probably think about more. I mean, I I try and use it wisely, but there is no doubt that I'm I'm uh, very comfortable. But what I'm not doing, I hope, is screwing other people. I don't think that anyone is poorer because of what I do. Right. Um, but I would be very happy to pay more tax. I don't need what I have. Um, that's a great quote. That's a very not. That's a very. That is an. That's a very uncommon quote for someone because. You know, we're so, again, we're so conditioned to think more, 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 more. And yeah. I think it's really just about insecurity. At the when, at the core of it, it's fear. What if I run out? Of, I need to study. You know, it's just yeah. uh, I'm, a, I'm a squirrel with an overdeveloped nut yeah. collecting. Uh, uh, but, of course, if we have a – if we, I mean, I, I worry, you know, what will happen? I get old, I get infirm, I get ill maybe, and I'm going to need money to deal with that. But if we have a proper health system, that worry should be gone. You know, if I know that that uh, uh, Obamacare or the or the health system in England, the national health system, will take care of me when I get uh, sick, then I won't worry about that. But of course, one knows that we have an aging population. Many, many more of us are going to be old at the same time. And sure. That care. So it's going to be it's very expensive. Uh, and if we haven't got our own savings, then will we be taken care of i think that's a big big worry and 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 you're right that is what one makes makes you hoard for the rainy day right but if we can create a society where the, we will be held up on the rainy day we won't be allowed to drown um, then maybe we won't need to hoard so much and we can spread it around a bit more yeah i mean i just i think so many of the i think so many of the things that are happening now are overactive survival mechanisms with a lot of what you mentioned earlier about, I mean, you, you drive through Los Angeles and that's just what a lot of our existence, particularly in this country feels like now of just so much stuff. There's too much stuff. I'm not, Oh, I'm not doing that. I need to look at that. I need to buy that. I don't have that. Oh, I feel, you know, in this city, Los Angeles, I feel like it's so full of distractions because the core of it is about <laughs> insecurity and desperation. And so, so many of a, so many of the people here, I'd feel like just need to feel distracted at all times and not be dealing with the real world, I suppose. Mm -hmm. uh, well, what is the real world? I mean, if you live in Los Angeles, it's a very different world from Louisville, for instance. It is. But what you said about walking through Nepal and like really being a citizen of the world, like that's mm -hmm. different than, you know, driving through Hollywood mm. every day of the week. Mm. I mean, you know, I just went to Japan and just even being in Japan for a couple of weeks was so, I mean, it's so necessary to get out and see what else is in the world to mm. understand other people, to understand other cultures, to understand, 
hey, it's not all about me and it's not all about us. You know, there are much older civilizations. Mm. You know, maybe go, maybe go learn. But mm. you can't, especially as a creative person, you can't tap all of your energies. You have to replenish that mm. from from time to mm. time. Mm. I think travel is a wonderful way to do it too. Because you you, you you see very clearly your life contrast in, in contrast to to the lives of where you've traveled right and that's just really useful yeah um, to see where you are clear I mean that you know the old story of the of the frog um, if you try to drop a live frog into boiling water it'll do everything every antic to not to get into that pot. But if you put a frog in cold water and put the heat under it, it will slowly boil to death without trying to jump out. And, and I sort of think that's what's happening to a lot of us in a lot of our societies. We're being slowly boiled to death. Sure. And if we, when we go to Japan or we go to Nepal and we look back at our life when we come back to it, we think, wait a minute. This doesn't make sense. I don't know why I'm doing this. <laughs> well, I think it's important. I really think it's important to uh, feel small in comparison to the greatness of the world and the universe or whatever. And because we, especially with social media and especially with, you know, we build up this world where it's like, it's all about us. It's all about me. It's all about me. Mm. And then getting out and realizing, oh, no, I'm a small, infinitesimal piece of this larger mm. thing. That's really comforting. And it's really nice, mm. actually. Mm. I Do mean, you... self is, self is a, 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 a sorry. I no, please, you. please. Self is the classic example of that, aren't they? <laughs> Absolutely. You know, you see someone go to the Taj Mahal, one of the most beautiful <laughs> buildings in the world. And what are they doing? They're taking a selfie of themselves at the Taj oh, Mahal. Fuck, I would do that. God damn it, you're right. <laughs> I did that all over Japan. God damn it, you're right. But what you should have done is to have looked at those buildings and just sucked yourself into them and taken the energy out of them and thought, right, this is, this is extraordinary. This will stay with me, this feeling I get from being here. Uh, and I must trust that that stays with me. And that will change me a little bit so that when I go home, I'll be a little bit different. You don't have to record it. Right. When people come and say, can I do a selfie with you? I say, no, 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 no. Come on. Take my hand. Let's remember this moment. <laughs> That's amazing. Paul McCartney said the exact same thing. Did he? He said the exact same thing. He said, people always want to come up and take pictures. And I just say, can we just share a moment? Yeah. And I, I, I mean, I don't know if it's a... I don't know if it's just a, a certain type of philosophy or if it's a generational thing. I mean, I... I remember before any of this stuff quite well. I was very much an adult by the time social media came around, but uh, but I but I am starting to appreciate real moments and 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 putting the phone down and going. No, I think I'm just going to try to remember this yeah. or see what kind of an effect it has on me because yeah. you're not you know you don't experience things when you're trying to record them all the time. Right. Do you have any of it at all? I mean, do you no. do you ever you don't do any of it? No, I I, I take the odd photograph. Um, but normally to send to someone to say, uh, look at this, isn't this great? Or you must come here sometime or whatever. But never with me in it. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I almost feel like it would be a challenge at the end of this podcast to get you to take a selfie here. <laughs> it's like you're, you're no. our, I feel like, let's see. I'm going to check in with you in the end. We still have a little bit of time left. I'm going to check in with the end and see how you feel about it. The one exception in your t- <laughs> as the head vigorously I'll be out shakes. That no, door. <laughs> <laughs> I think you'll find the doors are quite locked, Mr. Irons. <laughs> but uh, uh, what would you have done in the circus? You were looking at circus work. What, what do you think? I you would have liked done? to have been a clown. Really? Yeah. I. 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 I, I mean, it's, it's not too late. I could go to clown school. <laughs> I'd love to find my clown. It's never too late. No. Who is your clown? Is he? A, I, is he a? I, he's someone inside me. Yeah. Um. I mean, I remember I made a film a long time ago called Moonlighting. Yeah. And one of the critics said, and it's a review I always, you know, you forget a lot of the bad ones, but this is one I always remember. And he said there was something Chaplin-esque about Mr. Irons' performance. Oh, wow. And I thought, ah, wonderful, wonderful. Um, because, you know, the little, the little uh, Chaplin's character was a clown, really. And, and you look at some of the clowns in Cirque du Soleil, and he... I don't know what he would be. I mean, he would obviously... He'd be a big part of me, because I think... I think a true clown is... is You know, it comes from within the person. Um, but I'd enjoy doing that. 
I'd enjoy doing that. So that's what I would have done had I joined the circus, not the high wire. I might have worked with the horses a bit, but perhaps tried to bring the horses into my clown act. Sure. When people approach you on the street, is there one role that they particularly go, oh, is, you know... Depends where. Sure. And it depends who. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of Batman now. Uh, yes, a bit of that. There's a lot of Die Hard in India and Asia. They sure. love Die Hard. Um, oh, Die Hard, Die Hard, yeah. <laughs> and, um, uh, the, uh, 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 rather worryingly, a lot of very attractive young girls come and say, Lolita, my favorite movie. Interesting. <laughs> Which always throws me a bit. I, think, okay. I don't know how to respond to that. <laughs> Moving on swiftly. <laughs> I thought you were going to say they come up and say, well, that, I think the more disturbing one was, oh, Dead Ringers, that movie really turned me on. <laughs> really? I mean, that, you know... That, I, yeah. I feel like that movie is a defining movie. Did you feel like that when you were making it? It's such no. an incredible piece of cinema. No, yeah, I mean, it is. But then Cronenberg, you know, if you look at his, his history of his, of his films, that was a sort of extent. It was part of his, his um, development. And uh, he's gone on and continues to be a director who always surprises with the, the atmosphere he creates often in a pretty normal situation. But he just has... I mean, very few directors deserve the word esque at the name, but I think... at the end of their name. But I think Cronenberg-esque is something that most people would understand. He has a, a very curious and rather bizarre spin on everything. Sure. And I knew... I mean, I'd seen The Fly and I'd seen, you know, a lot of his previous movies, which are fairly broad in their awfulness, or, or not awfulness, but, you know, sort of bizarreness. Sure. And I thought, oh, dear, I don't know if we can do that with this. And looking back now, when I look at the film these years later, I see it does. it's a very bizarre film. But at the time, I was just doing it for real. Um, you know, playing the two, the two twins who were based on the Marcus twins and two New York gynecologists uh, who were found similarly dead at the end of their lives to the Mantle twins in the movie. Um, I, I, you know, people sometimes say to me, do you like the characters you play? Well, at the time I play them, I do, because I am them. I, you know, and how many of us, there are people who dislike themselves enormously, but most of us sort of put up with ourselves. Sure. And, and think we're all right, because we know we're trying to do our best in a difficult situation, which life throws at you. Um, and, and, and so... I didn't see it as becoming the sort of iconic movie that some people think it is now. It was just a, a piece of work, working with a man I like very much, David Cronenberg, playing two characters, yes, which was, which was a fascinating trick. Um, and I love tricks. Um, and and I'm, I'm proud that it's become a movie which, which people, you know, refer to a lot. Do you know exactly who... You're, particularly in that where you have two guys, but do you know exactly who your character is when, when you go into, uh, into work the first day, or do you have an idea and discover him along the way? You, you have an idea and discover him along the way. I mean, you obviously have to... You know, as soon as you put one scene on camera, you've made, you, 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 you've made some decisions. You have to, and you sure. have to stay with those. Especially if you're shooting out of order. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So, one hopes that that you are you sort of know the area. You sort of you don't know everything, and but but everything sort of as you do scene by scene, even if it's out of order, you just do the scene from the perspective. I mean, feeling like that character, and you're sometimes surprised. It's nice when you're surprised. Um, by what happens, but I don't really know a character till the film's finished, and then I, I know everything about what he's done in the situations that have been put in front of him for the film. But as I go in, no, it's it's slightly toe dabbling. You know, you go in the shallow water and you you hope the director won't give you a really involved scene as your first scene. Sure. So you sort of, you know, you begin to know how he dresses, how he looks, wh 
what he feels like. You begin to know what he's saying. Well, you know from the script what he says, um, but you don't necessarily know how he feels from the script. And so it's sort of it's an aggregate that builds and builds through the movie. Can you remember a role that you were surprised by halfway through of a guy that you, where you had that moment? Well, when I made a picture called The Mission with Robert De Niro, yeah, I, remember. Um, I played a, a Catholic Jesuit priest. I'm not a Catholic, I'm not a Jesuit, I'm not a priest. Um, and so I had a wonderful man called Daniel Berrigan, one of the Berrigan brothers who... Uh, Worked, uh, formed an organization called Swords into Plowshares, and they would break into nuclear establishments and daub red paint on the uh, on the planes and on the bombs, just to remind ourselves what the actuality of those things were. Sure. And Dan, one of the greatest men, I, my, I sadly died um, about uh, four months ago. But one of the greatest men I ever came across, and he was my mentor on that movie. Uh, because he was a Jesuit priest and he sort of he also played a little role in the movie but he was mainly there to guide me into that character and uh, I found you know I would do things like I would fast before a difficult the day before a difficult scene because fasting is a traditional method of clarifying the brain for many thinkers, whether they be Jesuits or Indian. Um, and so I tried that. We did the Jesuit induction over one night. And and I found myself in the middle of the movie talking to God. I mean, without any self-consciousness at all. Um, and uh, I remember before one particular difficult scene, I said to him, um, I really need your help in this scene. Because if I fuck it up, it's going to reflect on you very badly. <laughs> <laughs> well, that that is, raises a question of the sort of the art versus the craft of it. Because you're you you sort of lose consciousness in this scene in the sense that you're completely involved in the moment, and then let's say something happens, I go, "Oh, cut! The camera did a weird thing. Uh, okay, you're going to do that again." I mean, getting That's concentration. Concentration. Yeah, that's a, that's a big a big a big must. Uh, if you're going to especially film act, because you have to stay in that zone despite the mayhem happening around you. Right. Um, I have various little tricks. I mean, uh, between camera setups, which is the longest wait, as they're moving the camera and relighting a scene, I, I, I will sit and just do the crossword because it enables me to keep my mind ticking. Um, it's like putting the plates on the hot plate, really, mm -hmm. you know, to keep warm. Um, keep my mind ticking. Hopefully, it'll mean that people won't come and talk to me and distract me, so that I can just keep in that zone. Uh, and when we come back to the scene, I'll be in the same place and can. And and I think many people find ways. I mean, some people do tatting. I quite like to do tatting. You know, where you make um, uh, cushion covers and uh -huh. things you weave. Um, I remember. Um, actress called Penelope Keith who used to do that her house is full of <laughs> wonderful embroideries hanging on the walls which she's been doing and I thought well that's more productive than than crosswords but I do crosswords and then uh, you said you're going to spend time in England for a week and then you're going to do immediately another movie mm. and then you're, you'll be working till Christmas what's the other thing are you allowed to say what the other thing is yeah it's a movie called uh, An Actor Prepares Sure. Um, and it's about a relationship between uh, this has been Hollywood or English, but he lives in Hollywood, actor uh, who, who drinks too much, snorts too much and smokes too much and fucks too much, uh, who uh, uh, gets the role of the voice of God in a miniseries and then has a heart attack. <laughs> and the studio gets terribly, terribly nervous and... He's got to have a bypass or something. And his, his daughter's getting married in, in New York, his favorite daughter, and he wants to go back for the wedding, and they won't let him fly. And so he takes a bus, a road trip, and his son is asked to, uh, to, to go with him to look after him. And he hates his son, absolutely hates him, can't bear him. And, uh, and he's told he can't drink, he can't um, engage, as they say. Um, he can't smoke, he can't do anything. And it's, it's that journey 
So it's a comedy. It is a comedy. Yeah. Okay, good. Because I was going to ask you about that because, you, you know, you say, well, I pick stuff that I like. But, I, you know, I feel like sometimes the business gets a little myopic in terms of, oh, well – Jeremy Irons. I mean, he has to do uh, this this classic role. I mean, he can't. I mean, do you can you go? Can you just say, "Hey, I want to do a comedy," and then they find you a comedy? Is it uh, that? Yeah, you put the word about. I mean, I've just the one I've just finished um, called um, Monumental is a comedy. I play a, a a former Marine, a Vietnam vet, who is in a old vet's home and who has nothing to live for and wants to die, and. Uh, He's constantly making booby traps because he's quite good at that <laughs> to get the nurses and all of that. And, and anyway, his, his son uh, is courting this young lady who uh, they have a disaster. Somebody dies and they, they're on the run and they take grandpa. Um, it's his grandson. They take grandpa and me in the back of the car. And uh, it's a sort of long chase across America w- with me trying to die basically <laughs> throughout it and failing um do you but, like the Amer- do you like doing the american accent i do i do because you have such a great like i almost i was also i'm almost, almost surprised you didn't say well i almost went into radio i mean you have you have such a great resonant mm. voice well i'm lucky i try not to think about it but it, it is useful it is useful um you, you, have, you have to be very careful not to, if it is a strength, not to be aware of your strengths. Of course. Because they become your weaknesses if, you're, if you rely on them. Uh-huh. Um, I remember having coffee once with John Hurt. Do you remember of do you know John Hurt? Of course, absolutely. Who, another great voice um, and a great actor. And he, uh, he and I were, I suppose, we were hitting 30 and we, we were having coffee in London. We were neighbours. And, uh, and he said to me, he said, uh, he said you notice um, an awful lot of uh, good young actors appearing? And I said, yes. And they were. I mean, there were people like Daniel Day-Lewis and uh, Ken Branagh, and they were beginning to emerge out of drama school. And he said, yes, well, it's worrying, isn't it? <laughs> he said, do you know what I do? He said, when I meet one, I say to him, do you know, you have a wonderful voice. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then I say, have you ever listened to it? And you know they're fucked. <laughs> that is that is brutal next level psychological warfare. Because then they won't ever be able to focus that's, on anything other than their other than their voice. Such a beautiful voice. I wonder how many, I wonder how many almost great actors <laughs> yeah, we yeah. had <laughs> littered <laughs> about the, the, the John yeah. Hurt yeah. trap. Yeah. Oh, I could never stop thinking about my voice because of John Hurt, who you're right also has an amazing also yeah. has an amazing yeah. voice. But I don't know how you, I mean, it. Do, is there a special trick for not getting too in your head? You just don't think about it. I mean, you know the truth, which is that if there's nothing to be transmitted through that voice, then that voice is bullshit. Right. Do you know? I mean, if you take Larry King, for instance, Larry had a wonderful voice, has a wonderful voice, but if he wasn't a great interviewer, why would we care? Right. You know, he'd probably be on doing commercials. And and, and, and do we care about those people with wonderful voices who do commercials? I mean, I personally don't. Sure. Um, So, in other words, it's a... It's all part of the instrument, and what you want to have as an actor is an instrument which will serve getting the message out of, from your soul or your heart or your brain or wherever it's coming from, getting it out to the viewer. And, and therefore you need a body which will help you do that, a voice which will help you do that, eyes which will help you do that. It's just an instrument. It's like a, like a violin. You know, there are good ones and bad ones, and, and, and you have to nurture them. Well, you seem to take care of yourself. I mean, you look fantastic. I mean, you look healthy. Well, I, yeah, I, I, I am. I don't know why I'm healthy. I don't work out. <laughs> touch wood, touch wood. You're not walking up those stairs at the castle. It must be that, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I walk the dog every day. Uh, I ride the horse sometimes. I, I'm, I'm relatively... But, you know, I ache more every morning. Um, but I am... Re- see, I seem to be relatively fit and don't deserve... And I smoke. Still? Yeah. Can't wait for this interview to be over. So get outside. <laughs> <laughs> right now, there's just a giant cigarette outside. Be like, yeah. come to me. <laughs> yes, yes. 
Well, that's great that, I mean, listen, I think some people just have the genes. Some people have the, the good genes for that. I hope, I hope you're right. I'm lucky I was born with lungs 125% the size of most people's. Oh. Um, because I smoke, my lungs are now 100%. You're, you're, you, they, you, just, you know, that was almost for science. You want to just get them down to normal. Yeah, yeah it's, that's it's exactly. confusing to me. Yeah, no, that's, that's how it works. But and you feel pretty, you know, you said earlier, like, well, you know, I'm getting older. I don't know how many. I mean, you're still young. I mean, you're, you know, uh, yeah. but do you feel. I, my dad died two years beyond where I am now. I know we all live longer than our parents. But, yes. But nevertheless, it makes you think. Right. Do you know? Was it a, did he, did he have a heart attack? My, my he, dad was yeah, 72. He had, a, he had a stroke. Yeah. He had a stroke and then lived for a further year after that. Um, but, uh, yeah. My mum lived for longer. And I have a great aunt who lived to 102, so I'm hoping that I'm, I'm going to go on. Although I, I have to start thinking about what I'm going to use the time for. It's quite exciting that. If you, when you get confidence, you think, oh, well, maybe I've got another 20 years in me. All right, what are we going to use those for? You know, I ain't going to stare at the water all the time. Right. Um, so we'll see. Is there anything you haven't done that you want to do? I wouldn't mind getting a picture of my own off the ground. Um, and uh, But the business has changed so much now that the sort of pictures I would really love to make be very hard to finance. So I don't know. I don't know. We will see. I'd I... like to write something too. I, like, I love writing. The problem is I'm very easily distracted. There's so many other things I like to do. Um, and the only time in my life when I did write was when all distractions were removed... I was staying in a house on my own. There were servants who cooked for me and cleared up for me. It's in the south of France. It was the golden days. Um, a great director called Sam Spiegel lent me his house, which came with, you know. And I spent a week there. Um, <laughs> would you, well, you know, there are dogs outside who are making a ruckus. Would you, would you just uh, allow that dog to make its little noises without you <laughs> joining in? Um, Good girl, very good girl. There she is. Um, so, and I, 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 I sat in Sam's house for a week, being well taken care of, and I wrote. I had, no, I couldn't do anything else. I didn't have anything else with me, but I had these few things that people have been asking me to do for years, which I'd always put at the bottom of my pile on my desk, and I took those with me, and I wrote some articles, in fact, for a newspaper about various things, and loved it. And the time went like that. And I'd love to get back to that. I'd love to write again. But I don't know if I will. Well, you don't have to do it all at once. I mean, you could just write a day. You could write one day a month, one day a week. Yeah. I don't know how many writers do that. I, I have a feeling that you have to sit down and, and, and get through those moments when you think, I have oh, nothing, there's nothing coming, there's nothing I can't... I, and just fight through that until it begins to flow, and it may flow for half a day and then stop. I don't know. I, well, I think rhythm, I think also knowing me, I think routine and w w is a discipline which would probably help me. You know, as if every day I got up at 6 and I wrote sure. till 11 or whatever. Well, I think you have to trick your brain. I mean, when you think about, oh, wow, that's going to be like a month of work, and I don't know. So that's why if you say, like, well, I'll just write at this time, and then True. when... Because it just gets you to at least... It gets yeah. you to at least start. It's like the next cigarette you're not having. I'm <laughs> just not having the next one. <laughs> but I... Uh, listen, I'm, I think it's great. It's great that we're here at the halfway point. In a couple more hours, you can have that... Uh, so, <laughs> oh, as, God. As, as a plume of smoke appears <laughs> and you're out the door. No, but I... I, uh, uh, I, I think it, this idea of, of focusing and forcing yourself to to write I think is interesting and I hope you do it because mm. you know saying that the business has changed and you're not sure you'll be able to raise that I think you could I mm. honestly mm. feel like mm. you have established yourself you have a reputation and enough friends mm. but, I may be allowed to do it once right? and then if I failed that would be it but maybe that's all you need and, and failing is not the, the, there's no way to fail because the point is you just want to do it well there is there's a way to fail which is you make something and you lose a ton of money you can but that's who, so fucking who cares who cares well, if it's you, some of the person whose money who yeah, lends whatever. the money would care you know like you you if if your goal is just to, is like hey I just want to try it and see what it's like yeah. you know I mean yeah. listen if you were if you decided this is I'm going to throw all my eggs into this basket and it didn't do well I guess that would be uh, 
you know, maybe that would be damaging. Yeah. But I don't know. I'd be really interested to hear. I mean, have you thought about the – you said the kind of story would be difficult. But what is what is it in the realm of that you would want to do? Uh, relationships. Relationship, emotional. Um, I mean, I, I do have a story which I won't which I won't bore you with at the moment, which is the one I probably would like to, to make if I made one. We'll see, we'll see, we'll see. I always think I shouldn't be talking about those things. You know, if you talk about things you haven't done, it sort of puts a leak in the bucket and the pressure to to do it is not quite the same. <laughs> you don't want to commit to it. You don't want to commit to the universe yet. No. No, I completely understand. But when does the, the Man Who Knew Infinity open? What's the official opening? Well, it's open. It is open now. Yeah, it's opened and it's available. Oh, it opened a long time ago, yeah, actually. Yeah, yeah. 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 Earlier in the year, uh, yeah. Yeah, earlier yeah. in the year. Uh, but it's a, it's a wonderful movie, and the performances are great, and Dev Patel is phenomenal. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, and, and the cast is great, too, and Toby Jones is in it. It's Toby just, is wonderful. He's wonderful great. actor. great. Yeah. I've been seeing him pop up in a million mm. things right now. Wonderful actor. So, Freddie Jones, of course, you'd also recognize as his father. And Freddie Jones is, once again, rather extraordinary looking, as Toby is. Uh, and was a great actor. Well, he's a great actor. He's still alive. He's still alive. Yeah. Uh, will you ever... I apologize for asking this. You're probably going to laugh at me or be disgusted if you don't like it. Would you ever do a doc? I feel like a Doctor Who episode is somewhere in your... Doctor Who episode? Come on! <laughs> what, playing, a, playing, playing an alien from another... Where are my cigarettes, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, that's right. No, because oh, okay. I felt I felt I just got a slight feeling you were winding up the interview, and I I've always been a believer in using time wisely. Yes, and you know the the moment at the end of the interview, I might be able to uh, just walk through that door and light up a cigarette. But as I make my own, I thought I'd make I make one in advance as I'm answering your last question about Doctor Who and do who am I going to play an alien? No, you could play the master. Oh, you mean be the doctor? Or the doctor, or oh. the master. I we have a great one at the moment. What's oh, this? Capaldi, Peter Capaldi. Oh, what a fantastic. He's stunning. Stun yeah. That's why you could be, you'd be an amazing master. You'd who, be your who, nemesis. Who, who's the master? He's the nemesis. Ah. He's the nemesis of the doctor. Ah. He represents everything opposite what the doctor represents. You ah. come in and fuck with him because you're the only really two beings left of your, of your kind. Oh my God. When do we start shooting? Listen, I'm, as soon as you're done with that cigarette, I'm guessing. <laughs> I'll be there. I'll be there. <laughs> so but also we determined that your clown smokes. We know that your clown is a smoking clown. Yes, he is. He has smoke coming out of his ears. He has smoke like coming that. out of his ears. Yeah. Is, he, is he super funny? Is he, does he have a teardrop on his face? Um, he will have a teardrop in his heart. A teardrop in his heart. Um, Aww. <laughs> um, but is he super funny? I don't know. I don't know. Um, there are moments when I'm not super funny, but, um, but so I think he will have a bit of fun in him, yeah. He will, he will tear at your heartstrings. He will make you laugh. He will make you cry. Um, and you will see echoes of him in lots of people you know. Watching you make a cigarette is one of the most fascinating. I mean, I don't, I don't smoke, but it, it kind of looks cool that way. I mean, this gorgeous old leather pouch came out. There was a device inside. The rolling paper came out one side. The tobacco was in the other. It just, like Eli Whitney style just came through this whole process and by the end of it, I didn't even know what the hell you were doing, this perfectly formed cigarette, which is now <laughs> placed on the table next to a lighter that are inching closer <laughs> to the door. <laughs> well, I, um, I hope you had a wonderful pre-cigarette chat today. It with was us. a great pleasure talking to you. It was really lovely talking to you yeah. as well. I really, really enjoyed uh, I mean, is there anything else you want to say or any any life advice you have for people as we as we as we roll this out into a perfectly formed cigarette <laughs> no i think uh, the only thing i would say to people is soldier on and also don't go looking for a job go to make a job or make other jobs in other words i think we have to get on the front foot instead of getting paralyzed by not having any work in whatever field we're in think, how can I start something which will actually employ two or three other people? 
What do we need? What can I give to society? And I think that's the attitude we have to have. Would you mind signing off our podcast? We say enjoy your burrito. It's our ceremonial way of celebrating the present. What exactly is a burrito? It's uh, literally translated means little donkey. It is a basically a... <laughs> Enjoy your burrito. <laughs> I'm just I'm happy I made you laugh. That is that is my day has been made immediately. You enjoy your burrito and Jeremy Irons enjoy your cigarette. Bless you. Thank you so much. Bye. Now leaving nerdist.com. Enjoy your burrito. This episode of the Nerdist podcast brought to you by IT is greater than sci-fi which is uh, a podcast that you can download on iTunes or go to vmware.com slash radius slash sci-fi because uh, tech pioneer VMware said, hey, you know what we should do? We should, uh, we should take IT people and make them talk about sci-fi movies, Star Wars, Matrix, Terminator, uh, to plug the technology plot holes in there. So they know about technology and they are uh, talking about technology in some of your favorite movies and how it may or may not be consistent with actual technology so check that out again it's called IT is greater than sci-fi